So hi, everybody. Welcome, good evening, and thank you for joining us for the first Conservation Cafe of 2023. My name is Eliza Kava. I'm the Director of Conservation at Nature Forward. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I'm really honored to be able to uh, have tonight's cafe with Rana Cabell and Donzel Brown, uh, the founders of the Environmental Justice Journalism Initiative. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on their bios because you have them in writing and I'm going to let them speak for themselves. But let, let me just say that I think they're doing incredibly needed work. They are uncovering stories. Um, one of the reasons why environmental justice is so hard to come by is because um, it often happens to communities who are marginalized, whose stories are not commonly told. Just today, I was listening to the Nigerian author, author um, Chinua, uh, not Chinua Chebi, sorry, I'll come up with her, the name in just a moment, um, talking about the power of a single story and how when we tell one story about someone, it creates this stereotype that, um, that that's the one that we keep coming back to over and over and over again. And it was just reminding me about the power of storytelling and telling many stories, complicated stories. Um, in the case of what Edgy is doing, stories that include history and culture and politics and uh, climate, there's just so much woven together. So I just wanna tell you guys that the stories of yours that I have read and, and watched have just been really powerful. Um, and I thank you for them and for bringing them to light. And thank you for joining us tonight. So, um, oh, go ahead on Donzel. I, I was just gonna say thank you for inviting us and um, we very much appreciate the audience and we also appreciate the opportunity to tell our story because storytelling is really the, the backbone of what we do. And so if I can, I will introduce uh, EDGY or the Environmental Justice Journalism Initiative. Um, and so my name is Don Zell Brown. I'm the executive director of EDGY. Um, we have, um, we've, in a short time, we've grown meteorically in, in a very positive way, and we're happy to tell these stories and be involved in the community. And we really have three branches to our organization. Um, the one that um, really is the most rewarding one is uh, youth and community engagement, um, where we um, teach young people and community members about environmental justice that is happening in their communities, stories that often are not told. Um, our other branch is environmental science, where we have researchers from everywhere from the Smithsonian to Johns Hopkins and University of Maryland system doing um, um, research at our facility that we have a, a marina in the middle branch marina. Um, and then our third is professional journalism in which um, Rona Cabell has done a fantastic job of doing stories um, in multimedia ways with movies, with um, written word um, published in The Sun, The Banner, The Washington Post. And on that note, I will hand it off to her to explain how storytelling is important to our mission. Thank you very much, Donzel, for um, introducing me and Edgy so nicely. Um, and uh, for all the kind things that you've said and all your support of journalism. Um, so, so I'm gonna take my earphones off because I'm hearing an echo and it's driving me crazy. Um, so you can all hear me, right? Okay. Um, so one of the reasons why Donzel and I started Edgy is because we were seeing across the different um, institutions that he mentioned, environmental science, journalism, and youth engagement and activism, that um, there really wasn't a lot of diversity in terms of the people telling the stories. And so the stories weren't being told of disadvantaged communities. And uh, I've been a journalist um, for a very long time, 25 years. Um, I worked for the Baltimore Sun, the Chesapeake Bay Journal, Chesapeake Quarterly, and every publication I worked for was different, but the problem didn't go away, whether it was a small publication of dedicated professional environmental journalists like the Bay Journal or a larger one 
like the Baltimore Sun, there was, uh, it seemed like there was a limit for um, stories about black communities and indigenous communities. And if you did a story um, and then you wanted to do another story, it was like, well, we did that story. Um, unless you think this has stopped, I'll just share with you really quickly that a very important national uh, magazine that focuses on history asked me to pitch them some stories about rivers and environmental justice. And I pitched them a story about the rivers on the Eastern shore that Harriet Tubman uh, navigated and other people navigated to get to freedom. And the response was, we did a Harriet Tubman story a year ago. So there was not a lot of interest. I was not pitching a story on Harriet Tubman. I was pitching a story on the rivers um, and the what they meant to the communities. And so as you see, I think when you have institutionalized gatekeepers who are usually white, um, it's very difficult to get them to understand that, you know, you wouldn't think about, you know, just writing one story about George Washington or, you know, Abraham Lincoln. We do tons of stories um, or about the people who, um, who were affected by their regimes. Uh, so it's, it strikes me that this is an issue. And um, I just, I'm going to share my screen, if that is all right. Um, go, go, I, have, go. I have a, I have a presentation that I, I um, it's a, it's, it's a lot of slides, but I'm going to go through it fairly quickly because I want you to be able to see um, what, what I'm talking about. Because I think a historian I interviewed today told me the land tells stories, doesn't it? And and it does, but you have to uh, be able to listen to the stories that the land tells. Um, so I like to start with this image. Um, if you're, um, if you do any kind of outdoor work, um, and I'm sure this group does, you probably recognize this plant as Phragmites. Uh, so what that tells you is that this is what this is wet land because Phragmites is an invasive plant that only grows where it's wet. So you can already see if you know what Phragmites is, that we're talking about history that we're losing and land that we're losing. Um, that's me. Um, uh, the environmental justice movement really began in North Carolina in 1982 with um, a, a threat to bring in a toxic PCB waste landfill in North Carolina. And the, the, the um, environmental justice movement was very closely aligned with the Poor People's Campaign and civil rights movements. And they ended up joining together and it became uh, more of a movement uh, with Robert Ballard and the work that he did in Houston regarding zoning and sort of discrimination built into the zoning codes that made sure that like a lot of garbage and waste went to black communities. Um, and that's still what we think of when we think of environmental justice, if we think of environmental justice. You might recognize this if you're familiar with Baltimore, this is our incinerator and it's polluting a lot of the neighborhoods in South Baltimore where Donzell and I do a lot of our work. Um, obviously there are big issues with this, uh, which you probably are well aware of, high rates of asthma, fewer green spaces, lack of access to the power structures for change. And a lot of times these stories, they fall into a gulf. Uh, are they environmental stories or are they urban stories? And how do you tell them? Um, and Unfortunately, there are very few black environmental reporters in the nation and almost none in our watershed. And so these stories aren't getting told. Um, but I have been focusing for the last few years on something different, which is what I call rural redlining. Um, and when I say I call it rural redlining, I just decided to call it that. And I've been calling it that and nobody's corrected me yet. So we just keep going. Um, <laughs> you can see in this picture, this is Riley Roberts Road. And what the land is telling us in this picture is, okay, so you have a road, you have flooding, and then behind that water, you see those spinely trees sticking out. Um, that's part of a ghost forest. And the reason that the trees look like that is because there's saltwater intrusion pushing forward. Uh, saltwater intrusion is happening at a very rapid rate on the Eastern shore of Maryland. It has to do with withdrawing water for agriculture and just the, the way the water table functions. And so these trees are dying and this land is very quickly eroding. This is a public street um, and people do did and do live on this street. Um, so what I try to talk about when I talk about environmental justice is not just about 
the things we're trying to keep out, like incinerators and waste dumps and all that, but also about the things we're trying to protect. And a lot of Black communities are losing their historic and cultural assets, such as this church. This church was founded in 1820 by a, a free man um, who bought the freedom of several of his family members. His name is Arthur Ar Arn Arnold, Arnold Wallace. And unfortunately, since the picture was taken, that steeple you see has to, had to be removed because it was it couldn't be saved. It was falling apart. And so um, I, I work on kind of this intersection between environmental justice history and land. And um, again, looking at this picture, this is a different cemetery in Smithville. And when you look at this picture, you can see across from the, um, the sort of high brush, there's a marsh and you see some Phragmites peeking out. And this cemetery is also quite endangered. And you can see by what people have left at the graves that this is a place of where people love, uh, a place of love, a place where people honor the, the dead. And um, it's also eroding. So um, how do I tell this story? How, how did I tell the story of Dames Quarter, which is the story of our film? Um, there's a community on Deal Island called Dames Quarter. And um, it was the black community. It was the lowest community. And I was interested in documenting it because I worked with an anthropologist who did a lot of work on Deal Island and eventually even bought a home there, but he had not addressed the black community. And I wondered what was their story. And so I, I began with this map, which uh, shows how close Dames Quarter is to the water, again, with the land kind of speaking to us. And then it has people's names. Um, and if you would zoom in on the map, which I don't want to do because I don't want to mess this thing up, you would see that the names are like Jones, um, Shields, uh, Wallace. And so I didn't know how to begin. Um, and I wanted to tell the story about um, uh, people on, on Dames Quarter getting the lowest land to begin with, not having access to historic preservation grants because they couldn't come up with the matching funds. Uh, the fact that they weren't incorporated, which meant they couldn't get a lot of government help. Um, land preservation programs, of course, we all know that Maryland has an amazing land preservation program, but those programs typically exclude Black communities because they don't um, preserve any land that's flooded, and they're looking for large tracts of land, and Black families usually could only get very small ones. Um, so hello to the DNR people listening. I would really love to talk to you about this later. Um, and um, they don't get high priority for flood control and ditch management. So there are land floods more often. Um, they are not getting a lot of priority for news coverage. And um, they have the salt intrusion problem that I spoke about earlier. So how do we tell this story? Um, this, is a, this is the old Dames Quarter School. It was called the Dames Quarter Colored School. It's actually a Rosenwald School. And uh, we care very much about the Rosenwald schools and I can talk about that later, but this community is so remote that when Maryland did a historic inventory of the Rosenwald schools, they skipped this one. Um, it wasn't on the list, but this is what the school looks like. They're a cherished community school. Um, so I began um, in the graveyard looking for names and I found the name Nolden Superior Wigfall. And I figured, well, that's a name that you don't forget and maybe not a very common name. So, and it looked like from the uh, headstone that he had served in World War I. So I figured he was relatively prominent and maybe there was an obituary. And the, uh, the guy who works at the NAB Center in Salisbury told me, oh yeah, we probably don't have his obituary, but they did. Um, and so in the obituary, uh, as obituaries do, they name survivors parents, what he did for a living. And that took me to the census. And I was able to find uh, fathers, mothers, siblings. And through the census, I was able to con construct a narrative of the people who lived in this community and who they were. Um, so this is Ducky Wallace. His real name is Boyd. And he is a direct descendant of Arnold Wallace. Um, uh, this is um, Marlene Wallace Wigfall and her friend John Jones, also descendants of the original families. Um, these young ladies um, 
they're they're the Shores girls and their father owned uh, the shop and they had all kinds of stories about um, people coming to the shop and filling up their cans of molasses and um, their father delivering kerosene heat. And uh, there was a, a black resort down the street called Henry's Beach and uh, Percy Sledge and James Brown and all the greats played there and you could hear the music pumping through the streets. Um, there's another uh, person in the community, Chauncey Wallace, uh, and this is the pastor of the church, uh, Pastor Tony. This is a, what you see on Deal Island, and um, as you can see, sorry about my finger being in the picture, but the history is truly eroding, and this is the road where the homes on either side of that Phragmite, there were homes, and the homes are gone, and just down the road a little bit is where DNR bought property that was a hunting lodge, a white-owned hunting lodge, and they preserve that property. Um, and now it's a place where people can go and look at wildlife, a very beautiful place. But they, they did not um, do anything to really preserve the homes that were along this road. And so what happened to the, those homes is they just disintegrated. Some of them burned and some of them just could not handle the elements, the wind and the salt, and they just fell apart. And so you can see remnants of the houses, but almost no one is living there anymore. Um, this is John Jones and uh, right after Superstorm Sandy, so you can see how much it floods. Um, this is uh, a photograph I took um, just after a nor'easter. Um, the graves are often coming up out of the out of the ground. And um, this is again Sandy and you can see uh, the dire straits that this place is in. Um, there are many other places that have been lost. Um, this this is the original church, John Wesley, that I showed you. This is another church in Dorchester County uh, called Basil's, where Harriet Tubman's family worshipped. So this is a widespread problem. Um, and there's more of the Rosenwald School, and you can see what a what a shame um, it's it is to see it in this regard. So just a couple more shots. And so the question that I asked myself when I was doing my master's thesis is, you know, what if you could change all of these elements? You know, what if you could take a Black community and make sure that it had good high land to begin with and make sure that it could incorporate and make sure that it had control over its own destiny? Uh, what would it look like if you could do all the things that Dames Quarter wasn't able to do? And um, we have a community like that in Maryland, and it's called Highland Beach. Um, this is Highland Beach. It looks very different from Dames Quarter. Um, in the 1920s, Frederick Douglass's son um, bought this land, and he was able to incorporate it. Um, some of the people who lived in Highland Beach were Paul Lawrence Dunbar, Mary Church Terrell, and Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass' house is the yellow one on the end. Um, this is in the wrong place. I'm sorry. Um, I need to, these are, these are um, uh, archival images of Arnold Wallace and his freedom papers and how much, how much he was worth. And they're just in the wrong place. I have to redo this. I'm sorry. Um, so this is, this is um, uh, a photograph in the Highland Beach Museum of, of children on Highland Beach enjoying the beach. And um, this is one of the reasons that it is so successful. Um, this is the mayor, uh, Bill Sanders. He has a PhD in environmental science and he worked his whole career at the EPA. Um, and this is his wife, Zora Lathan, and she spent her career at Audubon. So the two of them are pretty much powerhouses when it comes to figuring out uh, environmental grants and you know how to do stuff. Um, and they have secured a couple million dollars, maybe more at this point for different elements of Highland Beach. And you can see some of those behind them. There's a, a river behind them and there's some public funding has gone into securing some of the trails and that kind of thing. So um, it, it was just to me uh, important to look and see because sometimes I think we make assumptions about people that they don't want things to be better when it's really the system in place that holds people back. And um, the last uh, slide here is a photograph of Highland Beach and across from Highland Beach, you see this little spit of land and that's Talbot County. And that's the land where um, Frederick Douglass was enslaved. And so from his porch, he wanted to be able to see how far he had come. And so this is the view that he sees. And he, he did get to see the view. He never did get to move into the house. 
Um, and this is the view from, uh, from Deal Island. And so um, I just want to conclude my, my talk by saying that um, if, you, if you think back to the slide and, and the land across the way, uh, part of what we're trying to do is, is show people how to see things that they might miss in photographs. If I didn't tell everybody that that was where Frederick Douglass has been, had been enslaved, it would be really hard to see that that's the case. But this story, this photograph to me tells more than just a story um, of Highland Beach. It tells a story of, of promise and hope and what things could be if the system was different and if everybody had the freedom to control their own destiny and allow the land to work in a way that works for them. Uh, I am going to stop sharing my screen now and um, uh, turn it back over um, to Donzel for any final thoughts that he has. Um, and then I think we're going to take questions. Uh, yes, thank you, Rona. I think um, everything that Rona has said uh, kind of sums up our motto of our organization at EDGY. It's our community, our story. And so we are facilitators and we're empowering people of various communities to tell their story and helping them tell their story um, as uh, an important um, aspect of being advocates or being uh, aware of the opportunities that the, particularly the Chesapeake Bay watershed has um, for communities and people, whether it's workforce development, education, environmental science, um, and, and beyond. Um, but we begin with storytelling and, um, and having the people of their communities tell their stories and facilitating that. So I will leave it at that and I'm open to questions. So thank you both so much for um, for getting started with this with our evening with your um, with your words and your images uh, and your presentation so far. Um, uh, we have a couple of Q and A's coming in and um, and we have lots of time. So I want to talk about uh, I want to ask some of the questions that we've already had uh, and then talk more about the film. Um, so. Uh, our first question is from Elliot. Elliot, do you want to um, unmute? I will give our uh, those who have asked questions, I'll give you the opportunity to come on live and ask your questions. Just give me a moment here. Elliot, allow to talk. And then Janet, you'll be next with yours. So I'm going to allow you to talk. You don't have to. You can put something in the chat to me and just I'll read it. Um, but Hello. go ahead. Um, hello, I'm Elliot, uh, and I live in uh, Silver Spring, actually really not far from um, uh, headquarters for Nature Ford, so um, excited to join this webinar. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, and this was something that uh, I thought of, so when you had the first slide about rural redlining, so apologies if uh, you already answered this, but I wanted to ask um, how, uh, for you, rural redlining as a term is connected to the historical use of um, the word redlining, um, which uh, you know originates from the practice of assigning lower economic access to neighborhoods with by POC residents. Um, I'll start, and I, I want on Zell to help me out because I know yeah. he sure. knows a lot about this um, in Baltimore, um, and he's kind of a, a person I turn to a lot um, to fill in my gaps, um, but basically um, my premise was that, um, you know, Baltimore was a place that a lot of cities were already discriminating against Black residents and other uh, residents, Jewish residents, Latino, Hispanic, Japanese. Um, but Baltimore was the first place to codify that um, in a law. 
And um, it was established, I think, in 1910. And the Supreme Court overturned it, I think, in 1917. And by 1920, I think it was off the books. But the discrimination continued. And so in Baltimore um, and in other places, there were actually lines on a map where Black people couldn't live. And um, there were, you know, banks wouldn't lend insurance. You couldn't get insurance. And um, my contention was that a similar kind of discrimination happened in rural areas. It wasn't as systematic and it wasn't as deliberate, um, but it all the same had the same result in terms of people losing generational wealth. So for example, you, you know, black people couldn't buy the high land, so they got low land. They couldn't incorporate, so they didn't have rights. Um, and um, then when FEMA and NOAA come by and, and offer aid, you know, they won't give you aid because your house doesn't, isn't worth lifting or um, your property is wet so you can't develop it the way you might want to. And so there's all kinds of other factors that come in to that. And so the, the trouble I had with my, with my advisors for my thesis were, was they were saying, well, you know, in Baltimore, it was so systematic and in the rural areas, it doesn't seem as systematic. And so I had some trouble kind of convincing them that, that this was a thing. Um, and I mean, eventually they gave me my degree. So I think I convinced them, but, um, but uh, as, as Donzel can tell you more, he's working like really in the thick of neighborhoods in Baltimore that have been redlined. And, um, you know, he, he knows a little bit more or a lot more about that situation than I do. So yeah, here in Baltimore city, um, it, it, I mean, we are the first in a lot of things and we're the first in um, zoning um, ordinances that are racist. Um, literally, Thurgood Marshall grew up on a street called Division Street. It was called Division Street for a reason. It divided communities. Um, what Rona has uh, looked into it with, um, which has been extremely interesting with rural redlining, is, for example, uh, uh, Deal Island, Dames Quarter, and there's a number of other communities that we can list off, is that their lack of ability to incorporate has prevented them to create zoning laws, has prevented them from social services, has prevented them from um, things, just general, um, you know, uh, waste services or cleaning their roads or plowing the snow or um, everything that you take advantage or sewage treatment, everything that you take advantage of as you accept as a part of normal life as, as a citizen, those towns were never able to be incorporated. So with them not being incorporated, they were not offered any assistance from any government um, you know, entity at all, whether it's local or all the way to federal. So um, they have been basically cut out of the system of any type, any of uh, when we talk about shore restoration or <clears throat> you're talking about, you know, protection, um, shoreline protections, they are not able to get any of those funds they're not able to do any of those things they have no resources to do just basically live as a community so they're literally left to sink in the ground um like th th there's no other way to describe that um they're literally left to drown and there's no um there's no mechanism there's no way that um, they can be helped because they've been denied the just basic right of incorporating yourself as a community uh, or be recognized as a community. So um, if there's something like trash pickup, they have to like outside contract themselves as a community and pay for it themselves. The, the county, the city, the state does not take care of those things for those people. Um, um, so, oh, sorry. Oh, and I just wanted to add, those are really good points. And um, I did, I, I forgot to mention those. And so, you know, with what Donzel is saying, 
so you, you have a situation where you have a, a flooded road, right? And there's a ditch that needs to be cleaned out. Um, but a lot of people have moved off this flooded road because it floods. And so then the county says, well, you know, there's only seven people who live down this road. They will be low priority for us to clean out their ditch. So it's like you can't live in your historic neighborhood because it flooded. And then you can't get help for the flooding because there's not enough people living there. And so it becomes like, like Donzel said, you know, they're, they have to, you know, they, they can't get those services that I certainly take for granted um, where I live. And as a result, uh, they're being punished because of the original issue of getting the lower land. And, and every problem sort of compounds that. And so that's why I felt like I could say it was systemic uh, because even though a cabal of people did not sit down like they did in Baltimore City and decide to discriminate, um, it still happened. And the result is still the same that people are losing their generational wealth and um, they're being discriminated against and, you know, deliberate, not deliberate, um, you know, it, it's, it's occurring. And, um, you know, that's, that's why I felt like I could use the term. And I would encourage everyone to follow Edgy uh, going forward because Rona's doing a great film um, coming up. And while Rona hesitates to say it's systemic, uh, there's some interviews in that film where you will see, you will see from the words of, the people who are administrating these these policies that will say things that will I I know I saw the tra I, I saw the trailer last night so I'm you know I'm cheating a little bit but um, you know it will give you shivers about how systemic it actually is um, in the mindset of the uh, surrounding communities that have not supported. Um, supported you know these um primarily black communities along the eastern shore um but i want to um bring some questions back to some of your other work with edgy um so someone asks have you done any work focused on the anacostia river and the communities of ward seven and eight in dc and i would modify that to say do you plan to because edgy is not uh is a fairly young organization Yes, we actually have. Um, so we're working with groups uh, in Anacostia. Um, it's only been about a month since we engaged and actually tomorrow morning, I'm meeting with them tomorrow um, to talk about their efforts at the Anacostia. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a Southeast DC native, so it, it comes close to home for me. Um, but yeah, so we are looking at doing some cultural exchanges um with their organization uh you know coming down to the anacostia because they're doing some really good things some really great things along the anacostia um and we are really focused in our environmental science uh, area around the middle branch of the Patasco river um so that's where our marina is that's where we do a lot of our environmental environmental science work and youth education work. Um, so yes, we we are very closely aligned with um, Anacostia, and um, we regularly talk to them about best practices that they have done. And um, so uh, tomorrow I have a meeting with APAC. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, but it's Anacostia. Um, community environmental justice organization that is working there. Yeah, APAC is the Anacostia Park and Communities Collaborative. Yes. Which is, yeah, all about bringing people who live in the area together around the park and the river, right? Um, yes. Wonderful, thank you. So, um, um, Mary Beth, do you want to ask your question about how EDGY works? I'm going to allow you to talk and you are welcome to just pipe up and ask your question. Sure, thank you. Um, this is a really um, interesting presentation, so I just want to thank uh, um, all the presenters. And I wanted to ask um, how uh, how you and Rona came to work together uh, and form this organization. So um, 
it, it, it's really pretty simple. We have a cohort of friends that um, we typically meet with on Fridays for pizza. <laughs> and um, and it's an eclectic group of people. And we raise our kids together. Our kids run around while we eat pizza and, and talk. Um, and there's scientists in that group. There's artists in that group. There's politicians in that group. There's community activists in that group and we're honestly generally like genuine friends the whole group um we've been complaining people have been complaining about everything about inequality and justice for for years during our group you know pizza nights and um and then i i, I would say george floyd kind of triggered everything um mm. And uh, we sat around the table and we were like, we have enough intellectual capacity to do something about it. And what are we going to do about it? Um, I, you know, I was, <laughs> I was uh, put out there as the leader of the initiative and Rona jumped on with me and was like, no, I see the same thing in journalism and environmental journalism. And um, so that's how we really came about it. Um, we had very um, like humble beginnings and not much, um, not much uh, idea that it would become what it has become. And we're certainly happy that it does, but we just wanted to do a film on um, uh, environmental justice here in Baltimore City with a, a local environmental justice leader, uh, Glenn Ross, um, who doesn't get enough attention for the work that he does here in Baltimore City around environmental justice. That's really how we began and then just blossomed into to where we're at now and where we can go. But it, it was just a, a meeting of minds, really. Thank you. I love a good origin story. Thank you so much. Including pizza. But thanks, Mary Beth, <laughs> and, and thanks, Donzel, for sharing. Uh, I want to tell everybody that the, the Baltimore video um, is, I think the whole thing is available on edu.org, right? You can see the whole thing on your website? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, so the last one we did was um, Disruption, um, The Highway to Nowhere. That's on our website. Um, we'll be screening that at the Lyric Opera House um on february 4th if anyone wants to come um we're also screening it at um uh the charles theater in april i believe yeah um, the senator by the senator i'm sorry yes yeah. yeah um oh that's so, terrific can you put links for those in the chat to the extent if to the extent that you have them if people are interested in coming yeah certainly you know that is a great segue donzel to asking Rona, to turn on the trailer and show it to the rest of us. It's not yet public to the world. You can't see it anywhere else besides right here, but she says we can watch it. The water, it came over the whole island, from up there by the bridge, all the way down to Winona, in front of that store down there. You had to wait. Water was everywhere. Yeah. Drowning. Our, a lot of our communities are, are facing this erosion of their culture. I have a heart for this preservation of this church. African American projects are hot. I don't think we should let our heritage just fall down. Learn the rules. The message is it's not easy. You cannot just put a hand out and get money. That's one of our biggest goals, not only restoring the church, but also restoring the cemetery as we don't want it to continue to look like this. Where are we gonna move hundreds of <laughs> caskets and graves? Where are we gonna move them? Because there's nowhere else for them to go. In the water.
yeah wow. it's, it's really something i'm really proud of it uh yeah so um um that's a really it's really powerful um imagery and uh language and the story of course um and people have a couple more questions about the community and i'm going to let people continue to put put things in um you know, uh, Kara asked, what are some of the things that could be done to actually save the community? Like, I guess, if I could interpret physically, what could actually, or, or perhaps it's about a move to high ground. I mean, what do you think, or what do the residents think could be done? Well, um, this is a tricky question because um, a lot of communities, black and white, are, are sinking. Um, we're going to lose them. And I think it's a question of how do we prioritize, right? Like we don't really question that we need to save New York City or Miami, um, but we question, you know, is this little church worth saving? Is this graveyard worth saving? So I think, I think the people who do the historic restoration and preservation um, need to pay attention to these historic and cultural assets and they need to be as important on on the list of what's important as things like the St. Michael's Lighthouse um, and the Cambridge Packing House and other places where they also have sea level rise and they are all of this will be underwater. Oh, I'm sorry. I've seen the water getting higher. We are having issues with climate change and and Deal Island sinking. I'm gonna let Donzel answer the rest of that question <laughs> while I turn this off. <laughs> I want to thank you for your fast technical uh, recovery. I'm going to see the trailer, by the way. It worked. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think that um, moving forward, um, unfortunately, I, the sad thing is, is what we're documenting right now is maybe, honestly, a lost cause. Um, but it doesn't mean that that story doesn't need to be told. Um, but there's other communities that are on the fringe um, where if, you know, if policies and restoration efforts are not committed to those communities, they also will be lost. Um, so, you know, we look at Dane's Quarter and Deal Island um, as far as climate change you know, goes uh, around the world, um, there's just some things that we have to chalk up as a loss. It just doesn't mean that they don't have to never exist anymore in the minds and the families and the communities around there. Um, but physically, um, you know, there are some shoreline restoration efforts that could be done. Uh, we've had, well, just today or yesterday, we had a conversation with the National Park Service about um, you know what that might look like, um, and and protecting more communities so they don't fall, they don't sink into uh, you know don't sink and are forgotten. Um, a lot of the um, you know. Uh, Places that get signs and placards and historical site recognition, you know, I mean, you can drive across the Eastern Shore, it's plantation this, plantation that, plantation this, plantation that, um, that are preserved and, and, and protected. But, you know, as Rhoda mentioned, like, Harriet Tubman, and Harriet Tubman is, is just a, it's, is a uh, is an easy thing to say because everyone knows who she is, but she wasn't the only one. Like she wasn't the only one fighting for her freedom. She wasn't the only one working those lands. She wasn't the only one working those waterways. She wasn't the only one canning, um, you know, canning the fishery fisheries. I mean, those those are communities and people who work that land and work those waterways um, who have just as much right to say that their story needs to be told, or just much right to say that their um, history needs to be protected, their land needs to be protected. Um, and uh, yeah. that's kind of, you know, while Deal Island, unfortunately, Deal Island itself, I think, might be a lost cause in, like, 
making it a community again. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's not another community that can be protected. Um, yeah, absolutely what Donzel said. And also just to, you know, we ask questions like this about black lands, but I don't think we ask those questions about white lands that are a mile away. So a mile away from the church, um, the Wallace church, the West John Wesley church is a brand new skipjack museum. I was there when Chop Tank Electric presented them with a $10,000 check. Um, they've raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to renovate and build a skipjack museum. I never heard one person say, why are we putting a skipjack museum on Deal Island? Where else would we put a skipjack museum? That's where the skipjacks were. So of course it's on Deal Island. Now, is it on land? Yes. Is it the same elevation as the John Wesley Church? I would bet it is, but we're not asking those questions. And that's what I think is important that we we sort of say, well, is it, you know, should we, what can we do? Should we save these communities? Well, you know, all I'm saying, all we're saying is that, you know, the people who decide which history is important are usually white, often people with a long time history on the Eastern shore, often people who had a connection to enslaving people. And they're not necessarily the most objective people when it comes to deciding what's important. And so, you know, we see black communities shut out from funding because, you know, they need to come up with matching funds or, um, you know, they they fall through the cracks in some way. Uh, maybe their, their um, historic church isn't historic enough. Uh, maybe it was historic, but then it was rebuilt. We see that a lot. So it might not count. And so I feel like, you know, I want to be able to be a conduit for these communities to advocate for what it is they want. And 100% what they don't want is for is to lose their history. Um, whether that means things get moved, whether it means things get lifted, that's really for them and the best scientists to come up with a plan. Um, all Donzel and I are really trying to do is make sure that they that they have a seat at that table and that they're able to have that conversation. And we're doing that through the stories that we tell. Wow, so um, um, we have a couple other questions about the Deal Island situation, but I actually, I wanna circle back to Edgy and ask, um, uh, I'll, I'll let David ask his question if he's willing, because I think it's a great one about Edgy. Uh, so David, I'm going to allow you to talk and hopefully you'll pipe up and, and say your question. And then I have another one of my own. Sure. So, so thank you very much for this uh, education and, and innovative work. And I'm wondering, you, you've identified the problem, you're developing solutions with your stories. How are you then interfacing with media to help to get the stories out to both the uh, um, professional and, and other media sources? Um, so, um, and all credit to Rona for this. I mean, we've been able to get um, stories published, as I mentioned before, the Washington Post, the Baltimore Banner, the Baltimore Sun, um, and I, spoiler alert, Rona has two more stories that's gonna come out soon um, in you know, widespread um, publications, and she's done a very good job in doing that. Uh, our the film that you saw the trailer for, um, we have several screenings planned for it, and then our other film disruption, the Highway of Nowhere, we have several um, uh, film or screenings for that in film festivals, and can, but not just film festivals. I think most important to us. Um, Honestly, it's like it's great if the sun picks up or the banner picks up a story of ours. Um, what we really get excited about is when community organizations ask us to screen our film in their community. So um, we have we've done that before, and we're going to continue to do that. So with uh, the Highway to Nowhere film, um, you know, we've felt, we've shown at the so the neighborhood that was affected most was a neighborhood called Poppleton. And we showed it at their film festival, their local film festival. So like the community 
could like see the history of, of what uh, of what we're reporting on. And um, so I, I don't, we're not motivated by widespread media access. We're motivated more about the communities, um, the communities that we're telling the stories about and that they know it. Um, we, we don't really raise a lot of money or try to based on like marketing any film or anything like that um you know certainly we do our best that we can um but um uh, we really honestly like to the core want to educate the communities our motto is our community our story we want the communities to know their story and that's really our total motivation um that's probably why our youth engagement and community engagement part of our organization is is the most robust um and um and most f fulfilling for us um so um we will welcome you know national attention or widespread attention and and rona's such a good journalist and you know the people we work is so good but um our, that's, that's not really our motivation is like widespread media attention we're not um i would say um we talk about this also we're not really a media outlet um we are operating as a think tank more than a media outlet that's clear yeah, I, would, I would just add to that um you know, we, and I put a link in the chat, we have our own journalism platform, which um, I pretty much do with our wonderful intern, Laura Quigley. So we, we post stories and we, um, we, uh, yeah, we, 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 uh, we post stories, we um, uh, write about what we're doing. We will link to work other people are doing that's relevant to our work. And I mean, I, I was in, uh, you know, at this point, I've worked in newsrooms, I've worked as a professor, which I still do, and I've worked um, for a academic nonprofit, and all of those places have gatekeepers, and other people are making the decision as to whether or not that's a story, whether or not, you know, you can tell that story. So we have our own platform, we tell our own stories. Uh, I know just about everybody who works in the Chesapeake Bay region media so i might send them something if i think it's worthy of you know going on the air or um you'll probably be hearing from me when the film is being promoted and you know if they won't pick it up that's terrific um donzel and i have made ourselves available for multiple interviews um we were featured in baltimore magazine i shared the link um we uh donzel has been asked again to talk to baltimore magazine about floating wetlands grant that he just received um we've been featured in other places and you know that's great we we like it but we're really not in this for the attention and the glory and the look at us our goal is really to elevate these communities i mean i don't want to sound conceited or anything but like i feel like i i've gotten awards and things in the past and you know what means the most is is the recognition and the support of the people you cover um, and that's not necessarily always a guarantee. Um, so we we really have that with the communities we work with because we're not just telling their story and leaving, we're part of what they're doing. And so it's it's a different model, but both of us, we like that model because, you know, that's why we're doing what we're doing because we're engaged. We like to be engaged. I mean, Donzel has a background in community organizing and you know, he's the person that you call when, when, you know, you can't, you, you don't know who to talk to about a problem you're having and he solves that problem for you. That's what he did in, in his past when he worked for Senator Mary Washington. So we, we like to do that kind of thing. And so, you know, um, I'm, I'm going to share it on social media if Vogue or Esquire or someone comes and takes a beautiful picture of us, I'm going to brag about it, but like, that's not what motivates us. I mean, so. I, I will give, if I can add a little bit 
like I'll give you an example and it's based on conversation I had earlier today. Um, uh, our first project was, was with the National Aquarium um, and the Henry Hall Fellowship at the National Aquarium and we were tasked to teach young people um, um, our curriculum that we you know devise. And the first day there's a young lady, um, high school student, uh, senior, and uh, the first day she told us, oh, I want to be an environmental justice journalist now, like that first day. And she actually went to college to do that. Um, so those are the interactions that we care about. Um, sure, we will take, you know, um, you know, the media picking up our stories, pick up Roto stories because they're excellent. Um, but that, that's, that's really not our motivation, how we operate. Um, and, and getting attention in that way. Although we do love it when a professional photographer comes and takes our picture. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that was a, a, a great picture. <laughs> it's a lovely picture. So, um, you know. Um, so um, I want to, what I want to do is turn back to Baltimore. So, um, uh, you're doing mo the 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 work with the youth um, it, mostly in Baltimore, right? And that's what you're referring to with the National Aquarium Project. Um, and I, I just, you know, the um, the Highway to Nowhere film and sort of when I hear Baltimore's environmental justice issues around um, pollution and toxics exposure uh, and redlining with land use, you know, issues and health issues related to that are are so well known. I mean, maybe not to, to everyone, but certainly within the environmental movement and within our region, um, those stories are pretty well known. But what I thought was so striking about what you were sharing about the Deal Island stories is that part of the justice um, concern is the loss of the history and the loss of the stories. And uh, of course that is happening in Baltimore too because of gentrification, which we don't think of as an environmental issue in the same way that rising sea levels is an environmental issue. Um, but I imagine that for the community members affected by both toxins and gentrification, it's all, you know, there's no need to make a distinction between what's environmental and what's not. So I wonder if that's affected you as you have worked with these communities from a journalism perspective and helped them to tell their stories. Has it changed the way you think about environmental justice in urban spaces to think about this, um, this question of unearthing history when you're um, dealing with what might be mainly thinking of as sort of a pollution issue uh yes certainly and um i, I would encourage everyone to see disruption in the highway of nowhere and it addresses that in that situation are a lot of what we're doing right now is along the middle branch of the potasco river so if if anyone doesn't know like everyone knows the inner harbor of baltimore but there's a middle branch of that river that comes through Baltimore City, deeper into Baltimore City, that is going to be redeveloped, uh, or it's being redeveloped now um, by whoever you want to call it, but basically let's just call it Under Armour, right? So it's, they call it Port Covington, they call it the Baltimore Peninsula, whatever it is, there's going to be a whole new city in South Baltimore. And those neighborhoods are historically black, or and not even just historically black, but historically like uh, working lower to middle class neighborhoods. So like Brooklyn and Curtis Bay, um, their their ecosystem, um, both environmentally and economically, is going to drastically change. Um, and we have been working hard to be on the ground level of holding those people accountable for that change and how what that change means to um, them environmentally uh, and environmental justice wise. Um, so um, we are working hard in that region um, to work with those communities to tell our stories, tell their history, reconnecting them to the waterways, which is one of our main focuses. Um, we have leased a marina space in that area um, to provide educational experiences, research experiences, and historical experiences with our partners there. 
Um, so yes, I mean it, 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 you know, environmental justice and environmental issues are, are very limited in the scope of when people hear about it. Um, but these communities are going to have to go through a drastic change in their environment and understanding what resources they have and protecting those. And that's like kind of where we're working now, mostly in that area. So, um, it, I mean, we find it when we go around the city, um, you know, people's basements flood from sewage backups. Um, and they walk their streets and they see the sewage drain clogged with trash. And they don't necessarily connect that your, your sewage drain on your street is clogged with trash connects to your basement being flooded with sewage. You know, it could be, um, you know, 10 degrees hotter in your neighborhood in West Baltimore because you have no trees right. and a half a mile away in Roland Park where it's shaded and nice, healthy trees. Um, those are things that we work on a lot uh, in educating what environmental justice is. And we've also engaged the arts in this in this situation. And we have a mural project and having people taking pictures of murals and art projects around the community. Um, what you see as you walk down the street is, uh, is as important as the air you breathe. So if you walk down the street, you only see trash and abandoned buildings and that type of thing. Um, you know, that that's, that's a really hard way to live um, because you don't see um, hope. You don't see, you know, uh, beauty in, in your environment. Your environment does not offer you beauty in any way. Um, but if you can find beauty in your environment or create beauty in your environment, that that's part of environmental justice for us. And I'll just add, um, Donzel has really been putting in the work in South Baltimore um, with these communities and making sure that they don't get, you know, like our new governor says, leave no one behind. He wants to make sure that none of these communities get left behind. Um, and really, um, you know, history is not on our side here. Um, every time it seems that um, land, black land was wanted for a project, uh, black land was taken um, for highways or whatever else. And the story is very similar in Baltimore, Detroit, Atlanta, New Orleans, name an American city, and that's the story. And gentrification, has, uh, you know, what happens is when people decide they want that neighborhood back for something else. Uh, Remington is a good example. I mean, Remington was a white, a very working class white community, and it started to become kind of Hamden adjacent. And now it's, um, you know, expensive and people have been forced out. So the forces of gentrification, I think, are um, are very important uh, in when looking at environmental justice. And I think, you know, what Donzel is trying to do is to bend those, um, you know, bend that idea of, of, you know, gentrification and fixing up the neighborhood and making sure that the communities that are there now are going to get the benefits. They had to live through the hazards and it's only fair that they get the benefits. And so he's basically making sure that he's in the room uh, with the people who are who are making these decisions, and that you know the community is able to have a say in all that. And so, yeah, it is. It's not what you think of when you think of environmental justice, but it is definitely um, an issue because eventually, um, you know, we live in a very expensive area, and land is reclaimed as a result of that because it's expensive. And, you know, if you can buy a house in Baltimore for, I don't know, $150,000 in a kind of marginal neighborhood, you know, versus $800,000 in DC, you're going to come here maybe, and you're going to do that. And then when you do that, you're going to be like, well, I would like a Whole Foods, please. Um, it would be really nice to have a cafe or, you know, whatever it is you want. And then those things come and eventually they push out, you know, the older 
the things that are there. So it's it's for sure an environmental justice issue, but unlike, you know, incinerators and um, PCBs, I feel like there's a way you can jump in and turn that situation around to your benefit. And so that's really something we're, we're trying to do too. Well, I just wanna thank you guys so much. Um, and I know it's been a very long day. I am tempted to um, wrap us up a couple minutes early. Um, uh, I, uh, if you want it, if you've got more things to say, I'll give you each a last word um, on anything you like. Um, and uh, you don't have to go quickly or anything, but I just wanted to say um, the questions are coming in uh, slower now. And um, I just, you know, really appreciate your time and sharing. I mean, I think this has been this is such a remarkable conversation because you're right in the way you describe the talk. We usually think about environmental justice as these very discrete, not, you know, issues around pollution, sometimes around access to nature and space um, is a way that certainly Nature Forward thinks about environmental justice a lot. But um, but this question of the loss of history and who gets to tell whose story is, is um, just really appreciate your work and I've been grateful to know about it. So I wanna give each of you the opportunity to share any closing thoughts. Uh, and then we're going to uh, uh, make sure to share all these follow-up links and things with the audience both right now and afterwards in my um, in my email that will go out with the recording. So uh, who'd like to go first? I'll, I'll go first because there was a question um, that I didn't get to answer uh, oh, about, about how these communities weren't allowed to incorporate. And um, I will just simply say they weren't allowed to incorporate because they were black communities. And there is no, there are no incorporated black communities on the Eastern shore of Maryland. There are several in Prince George's County. Um, and uh, famously, there is the community of Eagle Harbor uh, in Prince George's County. And right on the border of the, just outside of the border of Eagle Harbor, there is a very large power plant, which the residents of Eagle Harbor do not want and which pollutes their river. Um, and so I think the simple answer is, and this is sometimes hard for people to hear is, you know, when white people were in charge and made the rules, you know, they basically said black people couldn't do this or do that. And um, recently in uh, New Orleans, in Louisiana, um, there was a community that um, I forget the name of it, but it was um, it's right near the big cancer alley and it incorporated and became its own community. And when that happened, um, the legislature in Louisiana basically barred other black communities from incorporating, they put that in the law so no one else could do it. And what happened to that community was they don't have any power plants in their community, but at their fence line, they have power plants. So they're breathing you know, the, the toxins, but they're not getting any tax benefit from having it in your community. So um, that's, that's the answer to that question. And as far as closing thoughts, um, I feel very, very lucky and privileged to work with my friend Donzel and do this work. It's the most meaningful work I've ever done uh, as a journalist, as a human being. Um, but the the work is is difficult because um, we're not we're having challenges finding funding for it, and we're not alone in this. The other um, and maybe Nature Forward is in this boat too. But um, the other groups that I've been talking to over the past few days who do environmental justice work. They're, they're not like us exactly, but they're attorneys or they're advocates. Um, you know, they're struggling also. In the meantime, you have multi-million dollar Chesapeake Bay organizations with huge endowments that have lots of money and hundreds of employees or dozens of employees. And um, most of them are not involved in environmental justice. They're talking about it, but they're not actually doing it. And so my plea, plea to you is if you are a funder or you know funders uh, or you're involved in this ecosystem of funding to please make sure that you, you, you look at the small organizations that are pour, pouring their heart and soul into this work and look to, look to support them um, as opposed to the really big ones who um, might, you know, they, I'm sure they all love to get your checks, but, um, a, a, a check to us or a check to, you know, a small riverkeeper group or something like that is going to be hugely meaningful. Um, 
And if, if you send it to, you know, a huge organization, it won't be as much. So just think about that. Um, Cause you know, that's something that I think we're all, you know, all the kind of like-minded groups are experiencing that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Tom Zell. Yeah, I just want to share my appreciation for this conversation and everyone who joined us. Um, and uh, if anyone has any questions or any follow-ups, I put my email address in the chat um, and I'm happy to have continue this conversation with anyone that would like to, to do so. Um, again, thank you very much. Thank you. I want to just, again, um, um, I want to echo what Rona said about funding. Funding is a challenge. Uh, Nature Forward is a medium-sized organization in the region, and um, um, we don't struggle with funding the way small um, local environmental justice groups do. Um, but, um, you know, some parts of our programming draw more, are easier to fund than others. And the uh, environmental justice work does take special, uh, special efforts to get funded. Um, so I want to encourage everybody to um, support the film. Um, know that a, a very significant portion of tonight's proceeds will be going to EDGY, um, to which they can use it for whatever they want. Um, and I want to um, also bring up a couple of upcoming events that I think the, uh, that you all will enjoy too on the relevant topics. Thank you all for a lovely evening. And, um, and thank you, Rona and Donzel, for your work. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the conversation and more conversations to come. Thank yeah. you. Yes. Thank you so much, Eliza. We really appreciate it. And